You may be seated. If you have any kids want to head over towards Children's Church, we've got that going on. Shelby's leading the crew over there, so feel free to go that way. Everyone else, if you've got a Bible on you or something you read your Bibles on, you can either scan the code on the screen or you can open up to the book of Matthew chapter 8, and that's where we're going to begin this morning. And we're going to kind of go back to that over and over and often and some other different places as well. But Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 through 27 is where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. But let's uh, read this. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other side of the lake. Then a teacher of the law came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Then he got into the boat and his disciples followed him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. He replied, you have little faith. Why are you so afraid? Then he got up, rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So this morning, we're in the uh, fourth week of this series we're calling Shiny Gods. And we're talking about and hoping to gain a little bit of understanding that even in our supposedly modern times today, that we can still kind of be lured into some idolatry. We can still be lured into taking some good things that God has given us in this life and and making them what they were never supposed to be. And the commandment that God gave down to his people, and we sang the song uh, Exodus this morning, we're saying about the Exodus, and, and the commandment that God gave to these new people who is this newly formed nation, they're trying to learn how to live as a sinful people before a holy God. Do you remember what the first commandment was? Put God first. That's, that's simply what the first commandment was, to put God first. Have no other gods before me. And then the second commandment was kind of an expansion on the first commandment because God said, don't even make a, an image. Don't carve an idol. Don't make a wooden statue. Don't melt down gold and fashion anything that looks like one of these foreign gods that you came out of and are getting ready to go in the midst of, or even anything as if you could to look like me because I'm not like those gods. I'm something different. I'm something special. I want to tell you something. God knew very, very early on that our attention, our devotion, our time, our energy, our resources, and even our worship can be drawn away from him. They can be drawn away to all this stuff. And again, it can be good stuff. But if we make it ultimate stuff, God knows those things can just draw us away from the worship that we were supposed to put first. And we talked about all that the first week and how God wants us to have no idols in our lives. And today, we might not be carving any statues. You might not be going home and grabbing a piece of soap and carving a little idol out of it. You're surely not melting down earrings and rings and all that sort of stuff, stealing your neighbor's copper and making some, <laughs> making some graven images at home. Whatever it is that you do or don't do, we're not doing that stuff. But we do have a tendency, even in these modern times, to make idols out of things. Uh, the second week, we looked at one of those common idols. And, it, and what was it? It was money. It was possessions. We try to fill ourselves with so much stuff in this life to have the promise of satisfaction, but with all apology to Snickers again, they never truly satisfy. They, they just never do. Money, possession, stuff. We can accumulate, we can accumulate. And you can have all the garages, you can have all the basements, you can have all the attics, all the storage buildings, whatever you want. You're never going to satisfy yourself by putting stuff in it. You can have a bank account with all the zeros. You're never going to be satisfied. Money can't buy love. Money can't buy happiness. Last week, talked about another common idol, this quest in our own lives for status that comes from our pride. And last week, I told you that Jesus requires a couple of different responses from us. He wants us to be broken. He wants us to be broken, not so that we can be, oh, look how horrible I am, but so that we can be broken so that we can find the one who makes us whole. And that is Jesus who puts the broken pieces of our lives back together. But in order to do that, we also have to reject the pride that comes so often in our human existence, and we have to learn how to embrace humility. And Jesus was a great example in that because Jesus, Philippians tells us, laid aside the glory of even being equal to God to do what? To become a servant who went to death, death on a cross. So Jesus showed us the way. Jesus showed us what that looks like. And this morning, I want to talk to you about another common temptation that I think we all face in life sometimes. Maybe this morning you're sitting there and you've had a horrible, horrible weekend. (laughs) I know since Friday, many of you have been without power. Anyone still without? 
See them hands. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of people without power. Hopefully you had hot water, <laughs> whatever it was. Maybe you started a fire and boiled some hot water so you could take a bath this morning, whatever it is for you. I know you've had a horrible, horrible weekend. And so what I'm about to talk about this morning, you may think, well, that's not me. That's not me. I, I, I'm not facing any sort of temptation like that. I will say on the other side of that, if we get so inconvenienced over some things, sometimes maybe we've put them up on the pecking order where they, where they really shouldn't be. But I'm talking about an idol this morning that a few weeks back I mentioned. There was a survey of American pastors, and they were asked, what are some of the most tempting idols for your American congregations? And number one, overwhelmingly on the list, was comfort comfort. Just being comfortable in life. Maybe that wouldn't make our list. Maybe it would. I mean, you know, what's the big deal, right, with wanting to be comfortable? We hear so often these well-meaning phrases in life that God wants us to be comfortable. But what do we call it? God wants me to be what? Happy. And if God didn't want me to be happy, then he wouldn't make this one thing that I want make me so happy. Have you heard things like this? And what are we talking about? We're talking about this, this pursuit of convenience. We're talking about this pursuit of, of comfort, this very American pursuit of happiness. What's the big deal, right? Well, in 1928, there were two cousins, a guy named Edward and a guy named Edwin in Monroe, Michigan, and they invented a chair that has become an American icon. And I got a picture of these two guys and their beauty. It's a lazy boy chair. Anybody out there got a lazy boys, got some recliners? Um, we got a couple uh, decent shaped recliners at our house that people buy us and our kids tear up. Um, you can sort of recline in them, but <laughs> they, they found that it was, it was this chair that they said fit to the contours of a person's body that they named this lazy boy recliner. Now, annually, their company that has lived on long past them makes $2.4 billion a year. That's a lot of comfort. That is a lot of comfort for someone, right? You know, you might ask, how would a company make such money selling just recliners? But the name Lazy Boy sa says it all. It's what we're after in life. Our culture is obsessed with a lot of things, and comfort's one of the things at the top of the list. And it seems that at times the great sin of the Western world might just be inconvenience. You get in line in front of me with more than the 10 items, and you're supposed to be in a 10-item line, you're, you're knocking off my comfort, right? You're inconveniencing me. And then there's that other, I'm, I've told you, I'm on a great crusade to make sure that people put their carts up in grocery store line. <laughs> I'm on a great crusade for that. I mean, I go through, Cassie has to tell me, Matt, just let it go. <laughs> it was raining the other day, and we were there, and there was like 10 carts around this grass island at Walmart, and we were pulling out, and I about stopped. Cassie said, Matt, let it go. <laughs> <laughs> but why do people leave carts there? Because it's comfortable, right? It's more, it's more convenient to do that. There's a reason we have apps on our phone to order food from restaurants and grocery stores. You need Taco Bell at 2 a.m. and somebody to deliver it? DoorDash, right? It's convenience. It's comfort. There's a reason why people spend $2.4 billion a year on recliners. However, I will tell you this this morning, and forgive me for saying this, but I got to say it. Phil, I told you I'm preaching hard stuff this morning. It is hard to read the Bible and conclude that being a follower of Jesus ought to be comfortable. In fact, if you read Scripture, it says quite the opposite. So the question for Matt today, not us, it's just Matt, okay? I'm preaching to myself. The question for Matt today, and okay, throw yourself in. <laughs> Are we willing to lay aside our comfort? Are we willing to lay aside our plans at times? Are we willing to lay aside our own safety and security to follow Jesus? Because that's what we read in that passage in Matthew chapter 8. People who were confronted with whether they're going to lay aside all of these things and follow Jesus. And, and if, you've, if you're a student of Scripture, you don't even have to be a deep, deep student. But if you read Scripture at any sort of surface level, you will see that a lot of times Jesus would say some stuff to big crowds and the crowds would thin out. That's too much, Jesus. I'm willing to follow you, but I'm not willing to go that far. Jesus, I love you for what you can do for me. I love you that you fed me. You, you satisfy this entire crowd. My belly's full. Now what else are you going to do? And when Jesus said something a little too hard, the crowds thinned out. In Matthew chapter 8, there's these crowds that have been following Jesus. And this guy steps up from the crowd, and we're told that he's a teacher in the law. Might have been a Pharisee, might have been a scribe, might have been some sort of expert, but he's a teacher on the law of God. And he steps up to Jesus, and in Matthew chapter 8, verse 19, what does he say to Jesus? It's not even a question. He just flat out says, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. 
Isn't that what Jesus is after? Isn't Jesus after followers? All the way back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, when Jesus called the first disciples, it started with two words. He said, follow me. And they left everything and they followed him. And it seems to me that this teacher of the law, he's coming to Jesus and he's saying what? Okay, I'll do it. I'll go wherever you want to go, Jesus. But apparently, unlike us, Jesus is able to see the inside. He does this so often. A few weeks back when we talked about possessions and money, we looked at the rich young ruler. And this rich young guy, he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I, I, I've done everything, but I want an eternal life. I, I've loved God with all my heart. I, I, I've kept the commandments. I've done all of this stuff. What does Jesus say when he looks at him? He says, you, you lack one thing. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And he went away sad. That was in Matthew 19, 21. But that's what Jesus was after, right? People following him. That's what Jesus wants. He wants people to learn his way of life. He wants people to learn what it looks like to live as if he were living through us. That's what discipleship is, teaching people to do that. But that's what Jesus was doing with these people. He wanted them to follow him so they could be with him to learn to live like him. So seemingly this guy that comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I want to follow you. He's on the right track. By all intents and purposes, this guy is on the right track. But again, Jesus knows something more than we do. Jesus sees something deeper on the inside. And like the rich guy whose issue was probably his money and his possessions, Jesus sees that this guy has another issue. So what does Jesus say? Something that's a little weird. He starts talking about animals. <laughs> he says even and the foxes have, 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 have dens, even the birds have nests. But what does Jesus say about himself? I have nowhere to lay my head. I've got nowhere to lay my head. So if you want to be uncomfortable in your life, then come on, follow me. If you don't want to know where you're going to lay your head down tonight, come on, follow me. You want some inconveniences in your life that border on more than inconvenient, minor, <laughs> then come on and follow me. Be prepared to be uncomfortable. Do you have a comfortable morning routine? Do you have something that you're used to doing every single morning? In our house, my comfortable morning routine is listening to Cassie get ready because she gets up so early in the morning to head over to Fleming County. Now, Cassie is one of these people who is a morning person when she wants to be a morning person. I, I'm sorry. I'm going to use you for an example here, wife. <laughs> In the mornings when she is getting ready for school, she's got lights blazing. She's in the bathroom. She's watching her show. She comes in. She sits on the bed. She wants to talk to me, and I want nothing to do with it. <laughs> I want nothing to do with it. I, I, I'm dead to the world <laughs> until I have to get the kids ready for school, right? Do you have a morning routine like that, something that every single morning, maybe it's a shower, maybe it's an app on your phone you read, it's a news feed, it's your Bible, it's something like that. Maybe it's just that coffee that just hits right and nobody better mess with you before you have it. You know, one of those morning routines. Whatever your morning routine is, what would it look like in your life if somebody barged into your house and they said to you, all that stuff, you're not doing it this morning. And they forcibly held you back from it. I see a watch out right there. Nobody get in Mary Alice's way. <laughs> Phil, how early in your marriage did you learn that? It's 40 years today, right? How early did you learn that? You're still learning. Early, okay. <laughs> But there are things that keep us from our routines, right? And we just roll with them. That There's illnesses. There are um, accidents that happen. Maybe your alarm doesn't go off. Maybe your phone updated overnight and it kicked it off of the charger and, and it didn't go off in the morning and nobody called to wake you up. Whatever it is, we know that sometimes there are emergencies that keep us from our routines. Well, I want to tell you, for the devout Jewish person, in Jesus' day and even stretching out before, there was one thing they did every single morning, and that was pray. And what did they pray? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Just look at it real quick. It may be familiar to you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your, with all your soul, and with all your strength. They would do that every morning. And they would do that at, at set times. It was the first thing that they would do every single morning. Before they did anything else, they had to do this. And it was a part of instilling within them this routine and this tradition of following God. But also, it was a way for them to teach their children that this God who had made them this new nation had done all this stuff for them and everything in their lives was supposed to be devoted to him. But catch this. There were also some teachings of the rabbis in those days, these Jewish teachers who would tell people what they could do and what they couldn't do in many senses. If a person's father died, which is what we're getting ready to look at with the second guy, they were allowed to be exempt from doing this every morning to do what? To go bury their dad. 
to go bury and take care of their family's inheritance. They were allowed to bypass this to go take care of a family. So when this second guy comes up to Jesus, and what does it say he is? It says in Matthew chapter 8, verse 21, that this guy is a disciple. So this is somebody who is already following Jesus because that's what a disciple is, somebody who follows Jesus. And he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I, let me first go and bury my father. If Jesus was a regular teacher, if Jesus was just another rabbi and a long list of rabbis, all of these Jewish teachers, everybody listening to this would have expected Jesus to say, yes, of course, you have to go do that. What does Jesus say instead? Oh my gosh. <laughs> it sounds so harsh to hear Jesus say it. it sounds cold hearted. Jesus says, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. I love how the message paraphrase pulls no punches on this. I want you to hear what it says. It says, first things first, your business is life, not death. Follow me, pursue life. Isn't that just kind of a cold-blooded thing to hear from Jesus say? Wouldn't you expect Jesus to be like, yes, go take care of your dad. I'll come with you. Maybe we can raise him. No, you know, we would expect Jesus to do something different than this. But Jesus is putting priorities in line. Jesus is putting priorities in line. Jesus is letting this guy, everyone around, and for us it's recorded today so that we would know the life of a follower of Jesus is so important. The life of a follower of Jesus, it is so urgent, it is so immediate that it is the one thing that matters. That you do what? That you follow Jesus. Above and over all other things. This is an echo what Jesus is saying to this guy, it's an echo of Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all this stuff, the stuff we're worried about, even if it's super important stuff. What is that passage on worry about? It's about food. It's about clothing. What is Jesus talking to this guy about? Going and burying his dad or at least setting his dad's affairs in order. And Jesus says, seek first me. Seek first my kingdom. Pursue life. That's some hard stuff. That's some difficult stuff. And it calls into question our lives. What are we doing with our priorities when it comes to the things that help keep us comfortable in life? What does it look like for us? Then the last part of our passage that we read from Matthew chapter 8, it finds the disciples in trouble. <laughs> They're in a storm. They're in a storm. We saw a storm this past week, but we didn't see anything like what they saw in North Carolina and Tennessee and Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Florida, all that. We have got the outer edge of it, and it was bad enough, right? We did. But these guys are in a boat in the middle of a storm. And it says that Jesus is asleep, and so they think they're going to drown. Jesus, save us. We don't want to drown. Jesus gets up, probably like me in the morning, leave me alone. <laughs> no, he doesn't do that. He does what? He, first, he calls into question their faith. Why do you have such little faith? Then he just tells the winds and the waves, this is my translation, to shut up. And they do. They calm down. They quiet down. And in verse 827, we see that the disciples are amazed. Who is this guy? Nature obeys his every command. Who is this guy? So we've seen in this passage of Scripture, the guy that Jesus knew was dealing with comfort issues in his life, we see this other guy who's dealing with priorities. And now we have the disciples who are dealing with physical safety. And Jesus says to each and every one of them this call, this call that is for us today that may take us even to some uncomfortable, out of the ordinary, even dangerous places. Jesus' disciples had to find that out the hard way. But do you know what they found out? That if Jesus was in the boat with them, they're right where they needed to be. Even in the midst of the storm, if Jesus was in the boat with them, then they were right where they needed to be. Now for us, how often do we need that boat to be calm and parked <laughs> and no winds or waves? How often do we need the way for our lives illuminated, not just this step, but where? A floodlight 3,000 miles down the road. Jesus, I want to know where you're taking me, not just tomorrow, but next year. My life, I'm lucky if I know what's going on the next second, okay? You better forget about the 10 seconds before. <laughs> We want it all. We want to know it all. But sometimes Jesus calls us to some often uncomfortable places. The problem with our world today, again, is that comfort or convenience is king or queen, whatever you want to call it. That's one of the big issues in our world today. We often seek these things at the cost of all else. And potentially they could come at the cost of even fully following Jesus if the call of Jesus upon our lives gets too difficult for us. 
Jesus, I'll follow you, but not that far. Jesus, I'll go all the way, but not that other step. Jesus, I'm in it, as long as it's easy for me to do it. You know, for some of us, we've bought in in this life to believing some just outright lies. The first one I talked about this morning was that idea that God just wants us to be happy. God wants us to be blessed. God wants us to live in joy, and joy is not always happiness, okay? But there's another lie sometimes that we believe, and it's this lie that you've probably heard it, maybe you've even said it well-meaning, that God will never give you more than you can handle. I'll just go ahead and tell you, that's an outright lie. I'll, we'll talk about it here in a second, but there's another one that maybe it's not an outright lie, but it's an out-of-context thing, that I can do what all things through him who gives me strength. We'll talk about that in context here in a little bit. But first up this morning, let's talk about that. What do we actually mean when we say that God will never give us more than we can handle? What do we mean when we say that? We really mean we don't want God to give us more than we can handle. We don't want him to do it. God, I don't want you to put more on me than what I can handle on my own. The plans that I make, the, the direction that I have for my life, the way I want to live my life, God, I want you to bless it within the confines of what I want. I've set these guardrails up, God. You work here. Work all you want, but work here. That's what we mean sometimes when we say God doesn't give us more than we can handle. The truth is, more often than not, more than we can handle comes our way. And if we believe that we have a sovereign God who is in control, the king of the universe, he might not cause those things, but what does that mean? It's difficult for us to wrestle with, but it means that sometimes God allows those things into our lives. That's difficult for us. But sometimes God allows those things into our lives so that we can learn to trust him fully. So that we can learn to trust him fully. But that saying sounds so biblical, doesn't it? God will never give you more than you can handle. In many ways, it's a misinterpretation of 1 Corinthians. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, this is the verse that probably sounds closest to it, but it's talking about temptation. Hear this. It says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. You know, in temptation, we're promised we will not be given more than we can bear. But do you see where the strength to withstand temptation comes from? It's not from in here. You better believe it's not from within you either. It's within God. God is the only one who provides a means of escape. God is the only one who provides the strength to stand up under temptation. Yes, we may face more than we can bear in temptation, but what happens? We learn to lean on the God who can do all things through us. We learn to lean on the God who can help us to withstand temptation. All of life, if we were honest this morning, often comes at more than we can handle. All of life is often more than we can handle. But think about how dependent you and I are upon God. You're existing this morning. Why? Because God created you. You're breathing this morning because God created your lungs and he created the breath that fills them. You comprehend, maybe wondering why I won't shut up sometimes, but you comprehend with a brain that God designed to function the way it does. We navigate life's twists and turns, or at least we should, from what? From the wisdom God provides. We can endure because God gives us hope and promises. We can find healing, whether it's emotional, whether it's spiritual, whether it's physical, from a God who heals. All of this stuff that I just mentioned, it's more than you can handle. And it's more than I can handle, and that's life. But get this, it's not more than God can handle through you. That's the point. It's not more than God can handle through you. The promises of God in Scripture aren't about God keeping us out of uncomfortable situations. You don't want a place to lay your head, then don't come follow me. You want to go take care of your priorities, then don't come follow me. You don't ever want to be in a boat that's in a storm, don't come follow me. What are the promises of Scripture that right in the middle of those times, God's an ever-present help? Look at Psalm 46.1. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in times of trouble. If we only face the things in this life that we could handle, if we only face the things in this life that kept us comfortable and not inconvenienced, why would we need God? Why would we need someone or something beyond ourselves? When we are in over our heads, that's where we learn to rely on God. Look at Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 says, Do not fear, I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. We have promises like this in Scripture for the times that we don't know, that we can't, that we just, that God is the one who lifts us up. 
that God is the one who carries us through those times. We've got to learn to rely on God. If we trust that this God who makes promises like this is the one true God, no other gods like him, if we believe that his promises are true, then that is a God that is worthy of our worship. <laughs> that is a God that is worthy of our devotion. That is a God that is worthy of our love. And if he is this good God that we proclaim him to be, then we also need to understand that sometimes, even when we're in situations that are not good or we don't think are good for us, that does not diminish his goodness. It does not diminish our God's goodness when we're in situations that aren't good. You know, learning to lean on God, even when he allows more than we can handle on our own, it reveals some things about him. It reveals how great his grace is. We sang about God's amazing grace this morning. It reveals how unexpected his peace is. Paul said it's a peace that surpasses all understanding. It also reveals how enduring his love is, a love that never forsakes and never forgets. But this shiny idol, and let's go ahead and call it what it is, the shiny God of security and comfort, they are so strong in our lives. They just are. Because sometimes we have these blinders on that make us feel like we're the only ones who has ever gone through this, whatever this is. You ever been there? I'm the only one that's ever had to deal with that. No one else knows what I'm experiencing. Can I tell you something? Sometimes we even think that Jesus can't understand what we're going through. You know, he was fully God, right? Do you know what else he was? Fully human. He was fully human just like us. Fully human. Jesus can completely identify with anything we go through because he experienced it. He experienced the human experience, everything except sin. Everything except sin because he embodied what it was like to be human. And we've already read it from our main passage this morning, but what are some of the things that Jesus experienced that we experience? Maybe this is not your lot in life. Maybe you've been there before, but Jesus experienced poverty. Had no place to lay his head. He was born, born in a stable, people. I mean, come on. Jesus experienced poverty. Jesus knew what it was like to be poor. Jesus knew what it was like to be tired. Anybody tired this morning? Anybody tired on any given day? Yes. Anybody tired of me talking? Uh, Cassie? No. <laughs> Could you imagine being Jesus and having crowds wanting something from you all the time? Could you imagine that? Feed me, clothe me, heal me, raise my dead. Could you imagine doing that? And not only that, but Jesus also had these guys who gave up everything to follow him, and they didn't get it over and over. <laughs> He's teaching them stuff. He's showing them stuff, and they're just like, well, yeah, that's cool, Jesus, but... What does this mean? We'll follow you. Yeah, but you're not going to die. No. They didn't get it. And then on top of that, you add in the religious leaders who were constantly plotting to kill him. Jesus' life was exhausting. And the book of Mark, if you ever read the book of Mark, the book, book of Mark is really a book of action. But all of that action is interspersed with all of these times where Jesus has to do this. He had to get alone and pray. We're talking the Son of God here. The one who can do all of the healings and miraculous stuff we're talking about. But Jesus had to withdraw and Jesus had to pray. Why? Because he knew what it was like to be like us. He knew he had to draw his strength in times of exhaustion from God. You know what else Jesus knew that we probably know? Jesus knew what it was like to be betrayed. He just did. In the book of Mark and some other passages, it shows us that Jesus' own family thought he was out of his mind, and so they came to get him and tell him to stop teaching. You can see that up there. I think I got that up there. Not only that, but what did Peter do? Peter, the one we read from the book of Acts earlier, who had these chains fall off from prison, Peter denied even knowing Jesus right after Jesus was arrested. Who else betrayed Jesus? A guy by the name of Judas, who sold him out to death for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus knew what it was like to be betrayed by family, by friends, by those closest to him. Jesus also knew heartache because of all this stuff. He experienced sadness. He felt sorrow. Centuries before Jesus walked this earth, Isaiah, speaking for God, spoke about the Messiah who would come. And he, he wrote this in Isaiah 53. He, talking about Jesus to be named much later, he was despised and rejected. He was a man of suffering. He was familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. 
You know, not only that, but Jesus knew what it was like to be tempted. Matthew and Luke both show us this showdown with Satan in the wilderness. The tempter comes to Jesus. But you know what Jesus did again? Jesus did that without sin. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, it shows us why that's important for us today. Because he, Jesus himself, suffered when he was tempted. He's able to help those who are being tempted. When we are tempted, Jesus is able to help who? Us. Because he did it without sin. Hebrews 4 shows us this amazing piece of truth and comfort. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus knew what it was like to face what we face. So often we feel like we're alone, but don't feel that. Jesus knows. He's been there. He's experienced it. Jesus also knew physical suffering. And we know what physical suffering is like. We faced physical suffering. Even the pain of death on the cross. He experienced also something that we will never have to experience if we know Jesus. And that's being forsaken by God. Hebrews also tells us this in chapter 13, verse 5. God says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. You know why? Because Jesus experienced that for us on the cross. In Matthew chapter 27, Jesus cries out from the cross at this moment when the entire weight of sin of the world was upon him. And he, he senses this turn in the Father. It's almost as if God just can't look on this. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's important. Know this. If you ever feel like you are forsaken by God in this life, don't, don't, don't feel that way. Because of Jesus, you do not have to be forsaken by God. Through Jesus, you can become a child of God. Do not be forsaken. Do not feel forsaken by God. The full human experience, also hunger, thirst, sleeplessness. Jesus experienced all of this stuff. There's a song we sing sometimes, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. You, you know the song, What a Friend We Have? There's a verse that in that song that says this. It's just amazing. It says, Have we trials and temptations? Both hands up, right? <laughs> Is there trouble anywhere? We'll throw both feet up for that. I can do that while I'm standing here. But it says, We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. So often when life throws all of this stuff at us, that knocks us off of the pedestal we put ourselves on, <laughs> that takes us out of our comfort zones, it can be so just, it can be just paradigm changing for us sometimes. We thought life was supposed to go this way and it was supposed to be easy and it was supposed to look like this, but something derails us and it throws us off. And a lot of people will walk away maybe from the faith in times like that. A lot of people will walk away completely in those situations, but it, it doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be like that. Why? Because Jesus experienced all of that stuff and he experienced it for us. And he experiences it with us today through the power and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. That's the good news of God, part of the good news of God, what Jesus came, lived, died, and rose again for. You know, just before Jesus was about to experience this moment in his life that we've kind of talked about a little bit this morning, he was trying to get his disciples on, on the same path with him. He was trying to let them know that what he was going through was, was going to happen. And as I said before, the disciples don't always get this stuff. They just didn't always get it. But in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 and 25, Jesus tells them these words. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple, you're going to need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. So what is Jesus telling his disciples? You really want to follow me? You really want to come and learn to look like me and to live like me? Then you better be prepared to pick up a cross like me. You better be prepared to experience some sorrow in life. You better be prepared to experience some, some pain in life. And again, this is not an easy teaching for Jesus' disciples or even for us today. It's not easy for us to think about self-denial and sacrifice and any sort of pain in life that we don't, we don't feel we're due. But being a Christian means just that. It's a death. It really is. It's crucifying the old life and living for God. That's why baptism is such an important symbol. 
When you're taken below the water, symbolizing death, buried with Jesus, and then brought up from the surface, risen to new life in him, living for Jesus. It's a putting to death of that old life to live for him. Whether it's selfish nature, whether that's entitlement, whether it's pride, whether it's lust, whatever it is, it's putting that stuff to death and coming alive in Jesus. You know, that's not the way of comfort, is it? That's not the way of convenience. It's not the way of safety. But the truth is real life is found when we join Jesus in suffering for the sake of the kingdom. Whether that's self-denial, humble service, or sacrificial living, living for Jesus will always cost us something. But on the other side of that, we have to believe it's always worth it. It's always worth it. Martin Luther, the, the reformer of the church, w- centuries and centuries ago, he, he had this to say. Got that quote up there. Martin Luther said, A religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. But the good news is when Jesus invites us in, asks us to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him, we get all of him. We get all of him. And by God's grace, we can learn to do the hard things of this life. I told you I was going to touch on that last one. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Paul says this. He said, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Do you know what Paul's circumstances in life were? When he wrote this, he was in prison. But not only that, he had been beaten, he had been stoned, he had been robbed, he had been left for dead, he had been shipwrecked. (laughs) He had been ostracized by the community he was once a big pillar of. He knew what it was like to be in some hard times, but he said, no matter what, I, I found contentment. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this. And that this points back to that stuff he just talked about. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Once again, this verse has been taken out of context so many times. It has sprung up so many memes about it. You've probably seen some of these online, and I had to share them with you this morning because that's just who I am. Here's one. All things. What's the next one? If you can't read this, it says, what gives people feelings of power? Money, status, or quoting Philippians 4.13 out of context. I've seen t-shirts and I've seen mugs of this, okay? <laughs> Trevor, I think I shared that with you like months ago. I saw that for the first time. But this verse has nothing to do with so often what we think it does. Yes, God gives you all strength, but you're not going to go out and dunk a basketball when you leave this place, okay? Unless you could do that before or you start an extreme training regimen. Chase, you can probably put people in touch with that, okay? (laughs) That's not what this means. Paul wrote this verse again under house arrest. He was awaiting trial that could lead to what? His execution, and it eventually did. That's what he's talking about. I've learned to be content staring down my death because God can help me get through it. That's what this passage of Scripture is talking about. That's what it means for us even today. Instead of allowing the circumstances of life to to defeat us, instead of allowing them to deter us from Jesus' calling, we need to understand that there is a supernatural strength to endure any and all situations in life. And Paul had learned that. No matter what he faced, he said, Jesus gives me strength to endure it. No matter what may come, Christ is going to give me strength to go forward. So this morning, what I want to invite you to do here in a few moments, we're getting ready to sing, but if you guys want to go ahead and come up, I'll, I'll, I'll quickly try to wrap this up. But here's your response, one of them this morning. I want you to pray that we can live in that kind of trust and faith. Pray that we can live in that kind of trust and faith. Maybe it's taking a risk in faith. Maybe God might be asking you to sacrifice and you know what that looks like and it's not comfortable for you. It may be hard, but by the grace of God, we can do it. You know, we will only give up comfort. We'll only embrace the cross of Jesus Christ because of our love for God. It has to come down to how much do we love God? Is he worth it? Our willingness to sacrifice in his name is in direct correlation to the depth of our love for him. You know, Jesus would tell over and over again that you may be giving up life to follow me, but what did he say? Those who lose their life will do what? Find it. Those who lose their life will find it. Jesus had some harsh words in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 through 12. 
He said, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus says you're blessed when people persecute you because of the faith. There are millions of Christians around the world today who face in their life things that would just derail us completely. They just would. We have minor inconveniences in this nation that we call persecution sometimes. And we walk around, and I'm not trying to get on a soapbox this morning. Please, forgive me. But we call minor inconveniences in our nation and our, 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 our news and everything today, we call those minor inconveniences persecution. And who knows what tomorrow may bring, so I'm not saying that. But we allow these small things to derail us from what God has called us to do in this life to make his name great, to make his name famous, to make disciples of all people wherever we go, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when we seek our comfort, you stepped on my toes there, step away. <laughs> when we seek comfort over that, then we're not responding the way God wants us to respond. We may not be being the church that God needs us to be for our time today. How do you even define the blessedness that God has in your life that would bring happiness, that would bring comfort. If it's based on circumstances, you're never going to get it. But if it's based on God, if it's based on what He brings into your life, then no matter what you face going on around you or within you, you can know peace, you can know joy, you can know blessedness, you can know contentment. And it doesn't come from the comforts of this life. What I want to ask you again, another response this morning is this. Ask God. Maybe what he is calling you to in your life may seem too risky, but then make the decision to live in obedience anyway. <laughs> we don't know the responses from those two guys that came and spoke to Jesus. I want a resolution in that story. I want a resolution in Matthew chapter 8 where that guy was like, you know what, Jesus, I'm ready to go no matter if I don't have comfort. You know what, Jesus... My family can take care of burying my dad. I'll walk with you. I want some sort of resolution there, but it's not there. But for us today, there can be a resolution to our stories. We can agree today whether or not we're going to follow Jesus come what may, or we can still hang on to the way we want to live this life. And maybe, just maybe, one day we can hear the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 25, verse 23. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come into your master's happiness. But you can't go into it halfway. Kim, I'm looking at you over there. You taught me how to swim when I was little, when you babysat me. I'm not sure what that experience was like. I'm sure I was a little, a little jerk when I was little. Not much better now. But so often when you get in the pool, you get in on that shallow end, right? And you're just walking along. And then the water starts doing what? Slowly but surely creeping up. If you want to learn to swim, what do you got to do? Eventually, you got to push off the bottom. There's no half measures when it comes to swimming. Kim, you probably just threw me in the deep end and said, Matt, go for it. But you were right there with me the whole time. I know it. You got to push off the bottom. There's no half measures in following Jesus either. You either go all in or you're just going to, you're going to drown. So what will it be this morning? Will we seek our God who gives us comfort or will we seek the comfort that we try to bring into our own lives? Will you stand and I want to pray for you this morning and then I'll ask you to respond as God leads you. God, I just thank you so much for your word this morning. This has been difficult for me to wrestle with over the past couple of weeks. It's just been difficult for me to get through this morning, God, but you didn't call me to an easy type of life, God, and I thank you for that as hard as it may be sometimes. And I pray this morning, God, for that those within this room this morning, for anyone online who may be listening today, God, Lord, help us to seek you first above all things. God, the life you have called us to is not an easy one. It comes with denial. It comes with sacrifice. In many places around this world, God, it leads to people's physical death. But God, you said those who lose their life for your sake will find it. 
I pray this morning that we would see how much it is worth it to follow you wholeheartedly, no matter what may come. I pray that you would raise up a people today, God, within this place to go out into this world and be people who live for you in any and all circumstances so that people can see you shining through us, so that people can know, I don't know how they're getting through that, but we can tell them it's because of Jesus. Whether it's joy in the face of hardship, whether it's peace in the face of chaos, whether it's contentment where we've learned to live without, Jesus, we can never live without you because you will never leave us or forsake us. I thank you for that this morning, and I pray that you would have your way in our hearts and our lives in this space this morning as we sing and as we respond. It's in your name. Amen.